This is a little different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Oops. Um, financial goals. Your financial goals might be different than his financial goals. He wants to be the first person to make a million dollars off watermelon in Hawaii. You want to make enough money to send your kids off to college. You want to make enough money that you don't have to work anymore. Right, Davey? <laughs> Everybody wants to make enough money to work anymore. Um, but really, it's just setting your goal. The million dollar watermelon guy is going to have to work much harder than you are if you just want to send your kids off to college. Okay? So really just assessing where do you want to be, how successful do you want to be, and then you build your business plan based on that. The business plan that you guys are writing is for you. It's to make you happy, to make you money, to help your situation. Okay? It's not for anyone else. So write it so that it meets your goals and the things that you want to do with your business. Okay? Some people just want to help people. That's what they want to do. So if they can break even and, and, and make an extra 10% profit off their business at the same time helping people, that's what they want to do. That's fine. Good luck getting a lender. But you could do that and write that in your business plan. And then you'll, the whole business plan will kind of signify that. You know? It kind of gives you that idea of this person is not trying to make a million dollars. They're just trying to help a group of people. OK, got it? All right. Business life cycles. All businesses have a point where they are developing, they are initiated, they become popular, they mature, and then they die. Right? Think about typewriters, right? Typewriters. They were first invented, coolest thing in the world. Then all of a sudden they were like all over the place for 125 years, and then overnight, pfft, 1988, gone. Why? Because computers came along and took over. So it's like you could just kind of see that, that curve. And guess what? They're coming back. Mm -hmm. Hipsters are buying typewriters like crazy so that they can write their memoirs on them because they're that way. If you don't know what a hipster is, go to San Francisco. You will see one. <laughs> they're the guys with the handlebar mustaches and the derby hats, and they wear the vests with the watch chain. And more than happy to look out of place in society. Um, this is what kids think is cool nowadays, is to be nerdy. Imagine that. <laughs> it's it's mind-boggling, man. So well, let's talk about indirect and direct needs. Um, well, essentially, direct needs, meeting your financial goals, indirect needs um, are those people that you want to help getting helped. Okay. And the management plan. We're going to talk about your management team consisting of CFO, CEO, COO, and CMO, right? Chief financial officer, chief executive officer, chief uh, operations officer, and chief marketing officer. Okay? You can do multiple roles, but you have to remember when you do those multiple roles as the owner of a business, you need to take one hat off and put another one on. So today I'm marketing manager and I need to behave like a marketing manager. And then tomorrow I'm the CEO. And so the, this is the day I behave like a CEO. So we'll talk about what is expected of a CEO, what is expected of a marketing manager, and then you know what is expected to you when you play those roles. Okay? <clears throat> You'll realize that being an owner and being a CEO is usually a bad idea because there's, your passion is in the wrong place. Um, you're kind of seeing things through a cloud of deception. Um, you really want somebody who's a CEO running your company that doesn't have that fog and can see straight through the plan. Most owners can't do that, but most owners can be a CMO. Oh man, do they know about the product? Can they sell the product? They can talk about it for hours and hours on end. They have a passion for it. And they can build that kind of community base, those, those, those customer base that, you know, it gets involved with the face-to-face -face movement and the passion of the product. So you'll realize when we go through this that 
you may not be the best owner. Or you, may be the, the, you may not be the best CEO, um, but you might be the best CMO, and you might want to hire somebody on to run your company for you. I know that sounds scary, but it's the best way to make money and be successful. Not only that, if somebody messes up, it's not your Kuliana. You can come in and be like, I don't like what you've been doing. You're out of here. And then you can go to the bank and show, look, over the last two years, this guy came in, and my profits crashed, and da-da-da. But I have this individual that I'm looking to hire on, and he has these credentials, and I think that he would be a better CEO. So do you think I can get a possible loan for restructuring of my business? And then they can, to, you know, as long as they feel that you have a product that is worth something, then they will give you another loan so that, that you can find somebody else to fill that and then fix what he had or she had messed up, okay? So understanding the roles. Strength management. Every business has strength, every business idea has strengths and weaknesses. Okay? We will, during this class, really evaluate where your strengths are. I'll basically put a whole bunch of words up here. And if if you looks like that a lot of those words that are up there describe you, chances are that whatever it says up top is what you should probably play the role of. So if it if it's uh, you're organized and you're good with numbers and uh, you're not really much of a people person and uh, you like working late nights and you're really good at computers, what would you be? Chief financial officer. He doesn't have to talk to anybody. He can sit in his computer, which he's good at. He can punch his numbers, which he loves. So we'll figure out what works best for you. And then hopefully you can Bring it within yourself to accept the fact that you should not be in these other roles and you should be over here, okay? Um, and then manage your roles and responsibilities. Specifically, what are those roles? And we'll go over that as well. The next class is September 10th. I'm most likely gonna be out of town. Um, we're gonna have no class, why? Because you're gonna be out of town. Well, <laughs> other than that, give you plenty of time to work on this business plan. So between September 3rd and September 17th, you have two weeks to work on your, your business plan, which you should already have almost done because after every class, you're going to spend that week doing that section of, that, of the business plan. If at any time you find yourself August 27th and you're on financial plan and you haven't started yet, you may want to go to the beach because chances are you're not going to meet the request criteria for what is needed for each section of the business plan, okay? You need to take the homework home from you today and go do it. If not, you will fall behind, which is what a lot of people in the first class dealt with. They fell behind because they didn't give any due dates on anything. Um, but no, I don't have any due dates again because I'm leaving it up to you folks. And then on the 17th, we're doing private business plan evaluations. Okay, what I have there is four hours slated to meet with all of the students who wish to meet with me on time. <laughs> Don't show up late. But what we'll do is basically like 20 or 30 minutes for each student. Hopefully you will have emailed me your rough draft before then or at least what you've been working on so that when you show up I'm not totally clueless. But that's fine if you do. We'll sit down together. I'm pretty good at being able to go through a business plan going through each section, and then letting you know that you don't, have, um, <clears throat> you don't have your customers listed or described in your marketing section. Uh, and I'll tell you, you really need to have that in there before you turn it in. And then, you know, so we'll mark it up. We'll go through it together in about 20, 30. If, I, if it's 40 minutes, that's fine. Um, but I'll basically take the four hours and cut it up into sections, and then you guys sign up on the board if you want to meet with me. And then we meet. And then we'll, we'll meet again. That's the day the rough drafts are due. Okay. What you'll do is you'll come in that day with your rough draft at your slated time that you've signed up for. You will hand it to me. I will not accept email versions of this. Well, I might. I probably won't. But I really want you just to walk in, hand it to me, and then we can go through it and fine tune it all the way down to where we want it to be for the final draft. And then you'll have one week to hammer out any details and then get ready to turn in the final draft as you're presenting. So as you're presenting, 
we will have you come up in front of the class. You will hand me your final plan, and I will give you a check mark for handing it to me then. And then you will present your idea. You are not required to do a PowerPoint presentation, although I strongly recommend it. Some folks will actually just stand in front of the class and go through their business plan for the 15, 20 minutes. And it's really tough to go through that um, if you don't have some kind of visual. Posters don't work anymore. People can't see. But if you were to say, print off a copy of your business plan for each person in the class, which I can do for you if you give me your business plan four or five days in advance, I'll have my office print them off. And then each person in the room can get a copy of your business plan so that while you're going through your business plan, they can cycle through each section as you're talking about them. And then it's much more visual and everybody's happy and nobody's falling asleep. Okay? So if you want to do that, that's fine. Just know that PowerPoint, as confusing as it can be for some folks, is so much easier for the, the listener. Okay? Um, PowerPoints don't need to be pretty. They don't need to have fancy backgrounds with cool text. They don't need to have all the pictures in there. Although it does help if you can do that, that's fine. Just know that we're really just looking for that information up there. When you do your presentations, <coughs> presentations will be, depending on how many people we have in the class, um, usually about 15 minutes for your presentation and then five minutes for questions afterwards. Um, if it looks like we are going to have somewhere right around 15 to 25 students, then we might be able to extend it to 20 minutes. Give you plenty of time. All right? The reason why we have you do a presentation is so that you are confident of your product and of your idea enough that you can then go to a lender and present them that same information and get all the butterflies out and all the, the iffy questions and all that stuff. So present shows that you have a full understanding of your product idea, and that's the goal of this class, is by the time you're done, you have a full understanding of your product, how much it costs to make, how much does it cost to pick it, who you're selling it to, all that stuff, okay? Um, let's take a few minutes. Last time I did an introduction of everybody, um, that took a really long time, so let's, Cut it down to maybe about five minutes per person. But I'd really like you to stand up and just kind of blurt out some business ideas that you've been pondering in your head. Um, maybe if you say persimmon farm or something like that, there's somebody else in the room that's thinking the same thing. If you guys wanted to team up, I couldn't stop you. But I would prefer, um, if you can, try to keep it as a single group. But at least with the knowledge of what other people's ideas are, you could bounce them off each other. And then for the re remainder of the class, these folks in the room will have kind of a general idea of what you're planning on doing, OK? So if you don't have any ideas yet, just think of something off the top of your head that might work for your environment, um, or things that you've just, been, you've just been pondering over the years. Even if it's not agriculture, uh, maybe you have a, a great idea for a new pogo stick. Um, just tell us about that, OK? So uh, I guess we'll start with Davey. <laughs> Velma, do you want to volunteer for Davey? <laughs> OK. <laughs> My name is Davey Mahi, and I was in the last class. And uh, what else? Um, the business ideas. What, have you, what are you thinking about writing about? What I'm writing my paper. I, my, my business plan is very narrow. I like grow green tea leaves. And it's something that I worked for Don at Don's Grill, and something that his dad told me long ago before he passed away. He said, "My grow green tea leaves." He said, "No get pennies. You can get the dollars when you sell them to the guys on the mainland." And he had, he had the, uh, he had it all done. All he had, to do, all I had to do was just grow, and I did it. He's gone, but the idea is still in my head, and I wanna fulfill that. Because he said he can make money. And he, he was a self-made man. He made money on a lot of things that he did. So I like to do that. And maybe honor his, uh, I don't know what you call it, legacy.
we lived in Pana Ava, this is where mother in law Velma went to seminary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first class we were in, we um, certainly got the shocks of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard work. But um, here we are, glutton for punishment. <laughs> yes, that's for more. But, um, you know, for that last assignment we had, assignment number three, uh, that was talking about what we thought we would want to do. Of course, <coughs> what I ended up uh, turning on uh, my paper then was that my passion crop is my current poor Kenny Kenny Lays that um, we're kind of just starting a new business. And I just talk about um, being able to, with the knowledge we learn, trying to um, do pest management and things like that. Of course, our aunt that Paul Holla was so nice to uh, cut apart <laughs> for me in that last class and stuff. So <laughs> that's kind of uh, where my business head is leading to. Um, it's not a big money maker, of course not, because it's a seasonal thing, but it is such a beautiful product that I've, um, it just steals my heart. <laughs> my second idea is I really dug the idea of aquaponics because um, looking at the farm we went to, that was pretty neat, yeah? No fish, we are Hawaiians, we should eat fish. <laughs> Maybe that's why we wouldn't be so diabetic. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it was the best of both worlds, yeah? You know, like doing something with a fish tank and then of course putting it off into the rest of your plant life, which I think my main crop I wanted to do on the plant side is watercress because and isn't it so expensive it's now in the store? Ridiculous what it was. I mean, you can't even <laughs> afford watercress anymore. So that kind of was the best of both worlds for me, doing my passionate, and then of course being smart and trying to make money on aquaponics. Well, of course, Thank all you. great business plans are diversified. You're not going to line it all up into one product. So. Yeah, yes, and I was obviously too diversifying out yeah. rely on you know the seasonal flower <coughs> that's not making much money. I'm Belma Francisco, my mother-in-law. Um, my passion is palo. And you know how expensive that is? What, $8 a pound? But then there's this man that comes down the corner and sells it for $5 a pound. And people will buy it. You can make everything with the kalo. The poor kalo is the medicine. The ha is the medicine. And you can eat it as well. And the luau. Every part of the kalo is edible and usable, not only for regular food, but for medicinal purposes. And um, having had to work with my cousin over there, uh, Randy Ahuna, when I was a child, boy, we really got into all of that hapu'u and all of the trees and everything. We had to, by hand, cut and move and whatever. But Thinking back to how my mother did it all by hand, and we did the cleaning for her, and she did the planting, I was amazed that hill was just covered with kalo all over, and she knew when it would be ready to uh, harvest, and we would harvest in portions. And of course, they were way ahead of us because they had more helping hands, and they had more knowledge. But my mom, I was just super amazed with her when I think back to how that kalo all grew and how we survived on it. So I'd like to, that would be my plan if I got there. probably um, thinking about um, some kind of citrus fruit that I could put in the market and go from there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
My name is Muncie Pea, and um, I'm interested in raised bed gardening, and I, uh, just thinking of the word being sustainable. You mean um, like, uh, okay, are you going to make ra raised beds for other people? <laughs> just for myself. I was for looking yourself? at my grandchildren okay. and seeing how they could be a part of creating their own vegetable gardens as well. Where's but the business idea? That's a good idea. <laughs> this is a start. At least this, this is, is the introduction. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking at my grandchildren as well and um, how they too can get mindset into something that's been introduced to me. And uh, for somebody who is not really brown hand, green hands with gardening, this is, a, this is an excitement for me. So just being sustainable, number one, and then also I, I remember writing about sweet potato. I just have the passion for sweet potato. So that could be the first plant, vegetable plant, that I could be working on. So wherever yeah. it takes me, that's where I want to go. Okay. Yeah. So that would be your crop would be yes. sweet potato. Very sweet good. potato. Um, focusing on rare varieties and native varieties certainly is a lot more money in that than the uh, regular commercial. So uh, just know that in certain markets, especially with the luxury hotels and stuff, you can get whatever you're asking for uh, on certain varieties. Um, I'm Puhala Pea, and my plan, I don't have a plan. I submitted my paper, and I talked to my dad about it, and he's going to watch this, but he didn't like my plan. My plan was <laughs> to um, grow ulu trees and just pretty much bring back the ulu, how it used to just be grown all over our island, and be able to use it as a source of, um, to make our own flour, and also coordinate with our Samoan cousins down, down in Samoa, and actually use their factory, what they would be having, because they were looking at um, just bringing it back, revitalizing um, the ulu. So. Just, and just there's all kinds of different things that you can do with it. So. There is a massive oh, market on this island for ulu. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully we can get some uh, market data, market analysis data, uh, maybe do some surveys if you can't find any. And uh, yeah, definitely. Flowers. So that was my big idea. But that said, no, he wants fruits. If you're thinking exact only just the natural farming groups, mm -hmm. they would love to purchase that as a uh, IMO fee base. Oh. So if you didn't even do it for food quality, for you fun. did it just for IMO quality, it might, there's certainly a market there. So oh. Like I said, when we start, you start giving me businesses, like I start bouncing stuff, when people start bouncing stuff off, off each other, and that's when you get some good This stuff. is the Ulu season. Yeah. No. So aloha everybody, my name is Jeanette. I really do not have a um, um, egg property, but I do live in Puna. Um, when I started this class, it was mostly because I already do hydroponics, I already do aquaponics, I do all these other things. It was more about sustainability for me, you know, learning to do more sustainable crops <coughs> using better fertilizer choices, you know. But what I learned out of the first class was I can make my own fertilizer, I can, you know, learn. I grew up as a farmer, and my dad never did a lot of soil testing that what we did. He just grew stuff, he just tilled it, he just did all of it. So I learned more about testing your soil, what kind of crops work better, and how I can improve. But through that first class, what happened was, um, it, he brought in my horizon, and by broadening me my horizon, I realized that I should have a crop. I should have a crop because why wouldn't I want extra money? You know, why wouldn't I want to make that? And so, James put me in this position where I thought about three different crops that was good for me to grow, but I'm only going to share two of them. And one of them was the mangosteen. And there, when I started to do a lot more research, because you talked about it so much, I realized that that particular crop, it was uh, two times a year we can pick it. It was easy to grow. It grew in our elevation, our climate. The product made good money. It's only grown in Asia. And they use every single item of the whole tree. The, the fruit, the seeds, the, the rind, the bark, the leaves are used for something. So. That was one product I really want to try to get myself growing. Um, 
The other product that I thought about was kukui nut. And the kukui nut, simply because as we move into um, bioenergy and we move into when people are trying to um, provide oils, kukui nut is going to be one of those things. And because I work in the farming industry right now, um, I know that they've planted a thousand kukui nut trees. And that's because they're going to go after the oil for bioenergy, for power, for all those things. And it, you know, the thing about kukui nut is we use it, they're going to be using it for oil, but we use it for other things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we use it for medical, medicinal medicine, um, but they're going to be coming after it for oil. It's 70% oil content. That's right. Mm -hmm. So lucky for me, I have about 15 trees growing in my <laughs> property right now. <laughs> But, you know, that was the other thing. It's, it's easy, you just pick up your nuts and take it and they buy it. And right now I have someone in that would wanna buy kukui nuts. He pays 50 bucks a five gallon bucket. <laughs> yep. <laughs> For a kukui nut. So anyway, that was my, my you know, and like I said, it, it, my intent was not to, to think about a business plan or to do any kind of farming, it was more about being more sustainable, but this class is actually taking me to the next level. So, if anything, that's what I'm going to do. You can still sustain yourself and make money. So. I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the <thing. laughs> Hi, my name is Sheldon Waipa. Not sure about a market plan, but I was thinking of doing uh, organic chickens. My dad was gave me the idea that you could use a fertilizer for fertilizing trees. And also the cages, you could actually invent some kind of cage that you could move around the chickens with to help fill the ground area. I um, also wanted to try another one, uh, you know, like Nemo farming or like aquaculture. I don't see much like Nemo Ele Ele or mm -hmm. Nicole. Do you guys have any money doing that? Yeah, I'm not sure how to, <laughs> how to grow it, but that's one good market. Yeah, market analysis, you finding out about your product, see if it's a valuable product in yeah. the market. You know what people are willing to pay for it. Yeah, I know. Based yeah. on the grocery yeah. store prices, um, why not figure out a way to expand to what you need to do? Yeah, try to raise. Uh, the chickens thing. I have a for former student of mine that took the business plan that she had for this class, and she was able to get a uh, ten thousand dollar operation going through FSA um, after she finished this class for chickens, and now she's setting up a firm right now or a farm, um, and she's doing really, really well. And it's food of chicks. If anybody sees that advertised anywhere, um, she's doing a really good, she's taking everything I taught her as far as the marketing side. She's doing guerrilla marketing and all this stuff. And within six months, she's gotten a loan. Uh, she now has a customer base of about 50 or 60 people um, already meeting all the demands and she's writing another business plan for expansion. So um, she's that type of business that can walk into a bank eight months after getting her first loan and being like, you gave me 10,000, here's my numbers that I've done in six months, can I get 100? And they'll probably give it to her. So there's certainly a market in Hawaii for organic chickens. Well, that's good, yeah, my uncle just gave me an acre to try and start something up for it. There you so go. That's good. Well, I'm Randy Ahuna. I think one or two of us is the oldest person in the group. <laughs> um, we've been farming for the last, from 1950 to now in Paneva. And we've been going, my mom and dad actually started the farm. The grandchildren all came along. So, the two right here, uh, we kind of, going that way already. So you ask me what it is? Well, I got 2,500 trees of macadamia nuts. <laughs> I got about 100 trees of avocado. I got a pot acre of mileage. What else do I gotta do now? I don't know. So. <laughs> May I, I chime in? I just turn over. I would say <laughs> your type of business plan would be certainly unique. Um, your, your business plan that you would turn in for this class would be a transition 